There are a lot of reasons why I think we should not be sharing our homes with dogs or animals in general. And this video covers just another one of those reasons. What is Pastorella? Pastorella are a genus of zoonotic bacteria. Zoonotic means they can be passed between animals and people and can cause disease in humans. There are a number of species and subspecies, but all are quite similar. They live in the mouths of most healthy dogs and cats, as well as a significant number of other animals. They are a natural inhabitant of the skin, digestive tract, and oral cavity of a dog or cat or many other animals, like I said. But they can cause disease in those animals under the right circumstances. If a human is bitten or scratched by an animal that carries pastorella organisms, these bacteria can enter the human body through the break in the skin. They most often cause a potentially serious infection of the skin called cellulitis. Cellulitis is when the skin becomes inflamed and red. The bacteria can also be spread to humans from an animal's saliva or nose mucus. In other words, you don't have to be bitten or scratched to become infected. Just a lick from an animal can infect you. And as I will explain to you in a little bit, you don't even have to be licked by the animal in order to become infected and develop serious and potentially life-threatening complications. Those with certain diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, cirrhosis, and diabetes are more susceptible to the bacteria. Patients who are immunocompromised, which means they don't have healthy or strong immune systems, also have higher risk of infections. Symptoms of cellulitis usually begin within 24 hours of exposure to the bacteria. Uh, symptoms include swelling, redness, warmth, and tenderness of the skin, sometimes with discharge of pus. Lymph nodes in the area of the infected skin may become enlarged. Chills and fever can occur. Complications may be present in some, including an infection of the joints called arthritis, infection of the bones, which is called osteomyelitis, and infection of the tendons, which is called tenosynovitis. Other complications which can occur, though rare, include pneumonia, urinary tract infections, meningitis, blood infections, also known as septicemia, and eye infections. Osteomyelitis, infection of the bone, is a very serious condition. Antibiotics help bring the infection under control and often make it possible to avoid surgery. People with osteomyelitis usually get antibiotics for several weeks through an IV and then switch to a pill form. More serious or chronic osteomyelitis requires surgery to remove the infected tissue and bone. Osteomyelitis surgery prevents the infection from spreading further or getting so bad that amputation is the only remaining option. I'm linking you to a report of a woman who developed osteomyelitis after being bitten by a cat. It could have easily been a dog, uh, in this case it was a cat, and she became infected with pastorella bacteria. As a result of the bone infection in her finger, she lost use of her joint and can no longer bend one of her fingers. Uh, Dr. Steffens, an experienced hand surgeon, has a website called handarm.com, and in it he says, quote, Osteomyelitis is not uncommon when dealing with dog bites. If a bone gets damaged as a consequence of a dog bite, the entire infectious bone tissue has to be removed, end quote. Removing bone is no small matter. I knew someone who acquired osteomyelitis as a child as a result of a bite from an animal. The infection spread to his leg bone and was so severe, he needed to have portions of the bone removed. This resulted in him being disfigured and pretty much crippled for life. He was never able to walk normally again. Uh, Dr. Steffen says on his website that in isolated cases, amputation may be necessary. Meningitis, another complication of pastorella infection, is also very serious. Meningitis is an inflammation of the meninges. The meninges are the three membranes that cover the brain and spinal cord. Meningitis can occur when fluid surrounding the meninges becomes infected. Bacterial meningitis symptoms develop suddenly. 
According to the mayoclinic.org, symptoms in anyone older than the age of two include sudden high fever, stiff neck, severe headache that seems different than normal, headache with nausea or vomiting, confusion, difficulty concentrating, seizures, sleepiness or difficulty waking, sensitivity to light, no appetite or thirst, and skin rash. Newborns and infants may have high fever, constant crying, excessive sleepiness or irritability, inactivity or sluggishness, poor feeding, a bulge in the soft spot on the top of their head, and stiffness in their body and neck. Infants with meningitis may be difficult to comfort and may even cry harder when held. Not everyone who becomes infected and receives antibiotics will fully recover. The bacteria are capable of causing serious damage very quickly. They did a study on teens that survived meningitis infections. I will link you to it in the description box. They found that 57% of them had physical after effects. There are many complications that are typically associated with meningitis. According to the meningitis.org website, these life-altering disabilities and problems may be temporary or permanent, physical or emotional. After effects most likely to be caused by meningitis include memory loss, lack of concentration, difficulty retaining information, clumsiness, coordination problems, headaches, deafness, hearing problems, tinnitus, that's ringing in your ears, uh, dizziness, loss of balance, epilepsy, seizures, weakness, paralysis, spasms, speech problems, loss of sight, and vision problems. After effects most likely to be caused by septicemia, which, as I explained earlier, occurs when the bacteria spreads to the bloodstream, uh, include memory loss, lack of concentration, difficulty retaining information, clumsiness, coordination problems, arthritis and joint stiffness, scarring, skin damage, amputations, kidney damage, and lung damage. When the bacteria spread to the bloodstream, they multiply and release toxins that can cause blood vessel damage and leaking of blood into the skin and organs. Septicemia can be life-threatening. Gangrene may damage skin and tissue, and in rare cases, amputation may be necessary. I'm linking you to a report of a seven-week-old male infant who got infected with pastorella bacteria and became severely ill. The baby wasn't bitten by a pet. He wasn't scratched. He wasn't even licked by a dog. What happened is his two-year-old brother, whose hands were licked by the family dogs, was seen comforting the baby and allowing the baby to suck on his little finger. And that is how the baby got infected. They had no idea it was Pastorella. The baby was initially misdiagnosed. He developed a severe case of meningitis and was hospitalized for three weeks. He's lucky to have survived. Six months after discharge from the hospital, his vision was still affected, and he had residual hemiparesis, which is weakness of one entire side of the body. So this is the chance you're taking with your children, simply by having a dog in the home or a cat. Sorry, all you cat lovers, but it's true. And it's completely preventable. You do not have to have a dog. Many people don't have dogs, and we're doing just fine. Our kids are growing up happy and healthy. There really is no need to expose your kids to this unnecessary risk. People act as though being pet-free is not even an option. It most definitely is an option, and it's the only responsible option for parents with children. Uh, having an animal around your kids, especially a dog, which can kill your child or dismember your child, disfigure your child. I mean, a cat is not going to do that. Uh, it's just totally irresponsible to have a dog that can severely injure your kids. It's not necessary to bring an animal like this into your house. Dogs are natural predators. See my video about this. Even if you don't allow a dog near your baby... If you allow the dog to lick you, you can inadvertently pass the bacteria along to your child and infect them with a disease that can leave them with serious lifelong complications or even kill them. I think maybe some parents are afraid that if you do not get pets for your children, that they will not learn kindness, compassion, or responsibility. But this is so false. 
you can teach your children to be kind and compassionate to uh, wild animals. You can instill a love for nature in your children by going hiking, by observing toads and frogs and teaching them not to abuse these animals. Often we go to the beach and we see kids, and these are kids that have dogs, right? Uh, They're picking up frogs and catching fish, like minnows with nets, and then they put them into buckets, and then they leave the animals in these buckets to bake in the sun, and they're, you know, picking them up roughly, and and I just look at this, and I'm like, these parents think that they're teaching their kids compassion and whatever. These kids don't know how to be kind to animals. Well, maybe they do to dogs, right? Don't pull the tail on the cat or whatever, but the parents are not teaching them to be kind to other animals. It's like they call themselves animal lovers, but what they are really are pet lovers. You know, I teach my children to be animal lovers. I don't even know if lover is the right word, but just to have respect uh, for animals and we leave them alone and we watch them with wonder from a distance understanding that approaching them stresses them out handling them stresses them out you know you don't have to have an animal in your house to have compassion and respect for animals that's just a flat-out lie and uh, responsibility you can teach them responsibility in many other ways I need to make a video about this Uh, anyhow and I will. I'm going to. Life without pets is possible. I think people just can't imagine it. I, I got to make a video showing people how it's possible. And you can have a great life and raise amazing children without animals in your house. Anyhow, eye infections due to pastorella are rare, but include endophthalmitis, keratitis, corneal ulcers, paranodes oculoglandular syndrome, and conjunctivitis. I'm linking you to a case report of a 70-year-old man with keratitis caused by pastorella bacteria, and here's what that looks like. Uh, Here we have a case of a 69-year-old immunocompromised man with conjunctivitis caused by pastorella bacteria. And here's a case of endophthalmitis caused by pastorella infection. Unlike the other reports, this patient had no history of animal bites or scratch wounds So the infection was spread by the saliva or snot of an infected animal. It says the patient's vision remained poor owing to the extensive amount of retinal necrosis. Necrosis, if you don't know, means dead tissue. So the bacteria killed the tissue in his eyeball. I was unable to find any images associated with that particular case report, but I looked some up on Google Images and decided to include some in my video for your enjoyment. This is what endophthalmitis looks like. It's horrible, as you can see. So they say there are different things you can do to prevent infection. Um, They say to never leave a young child alone with a pet. Well, duh. Uh, do not try to separate fighting animals. How about not even getting your child a pet? That's even better. Uh, Do not try to separate fighting animals. Like, don't even bother getting any animals. They won't fight. Problem solved. Avoid sick animals and animals that you don't know. How about avoid all animals? Uh, Leave animals alone when they're eating. Even better. Don't have an animal in your house. Keep pets on a leash when in public. Don't have a pet. Select your family pet carefully. Don't even get a family pet. Bottom line, don't get a pet. Don't interact with animals. Observe them from a distance. Appreciate them from afar. They belong in the wild. They do not belong in our homes or communities. This review from the American Society for Microbiology concludes with the following words. They say, quote, our interactions with pets and other domestic and wild animals are unlikely to diminish in the future. Well, I disagree with that. I believe people are starting to wake up to the fact that we no longer have a need for animals in our homes. At one point in time, our ancestors may have needed dogs to help with hunting or herding or protection, but we do not need them any longer. Uh, And, you know, I have people say to me that dogs do so much good in the world. They talk about the love between humans and their pets and how beneficial pets are to humans. 
and they don't understand why I cannot acknowledge this good. I do acknowledge that dogs may help certain people in certain ways, but I focus on the most significant aspect of human relationships to dogs. Having chunks of your flesh ripped out, being dismembered, children being shredded up, babies decapitated, throats ripped out, faces ripped off, blindness due to roundworm infections, permanent disability due to uh, you know being physically attacked, but also due to disease and uh, being disfigured for life, PTSD, death, being harassed and threatened by barking dogs just for walking peacefully down the street or working in your yard, contamination of our water by tons of untreated dog waste, the terrible and very serious health effects of being exposed to chronic barking, which is noise pollution. All of this is so much more significant than any warm, fuzzy feelings people may feel for their pets. You know, and they talk about service animals. Service dogs comprise only 0.56% of the dog population. You know, the bad dogs do vastly outweighs any good they may do by a large margin. And people are waking up to this fact with the help of my channel and other anti-dog channels. Uh, awareness is growing. Is you know, People are becoming more aware. And in the future, uh, people are going to see how ridiculous it is to keep animals in their homes. And it's going to be illegal. It's only a question of time before uh, it becomes illegal to have these animals in our homes because of all the damage they do. So this report concludes with the following words, quote, Considering the high prevalence of Pastorella species as part of the microbiota of domestic and wild animals, it would be prudent for us to consider zoonotic transmission of Pastorella multocyta as a serious risk for infection, end quote. These statistics I'm sharing with you here are taken from the dogbitelaw.com website. You can find similar numbers elsewhere in multiple places on the internet. I think these numbers are outdated though. Uh, if you can come across more recent statistics, uh, please do share them in the comments. I suspect the true number of dog bites to be much higher today due to the fact that more dogs are being kept as pets today in America. And by the way, these numbers are for the USA only. We are looking at close to, if not over 800,000 dog bites that are serious enough to require medical care each year. That is not an insignificant number. There are a lot of people uh, suffering from infected dog bites every year, as well as the complications thereof. And uh, Pastorella bacteria is only one type of bacteria that's present in the dog's mouth that can cause disease in humans. There are many other kinds of bacteria and pathogens in the mouths of healthy dogs, which under the right circumstances can cause life-threatening disease in humans, as well as bacteria in the feces of dogs, which is left behind even if responsible owners pick up after their dogs. There are always traces left behind in the environment which can uh, infect humans. I will be discussing uh, these pathogens in future videos. So I thank you very much for watching. Please share this video. And remember, the future is dog-free.